great to be with you guys this morning. My name is Melissa. I'm the children's pastor here. What would you say if I told you that right now we are in the middle of a loneliness epidemic? We are in a loneliness epidemic. At least over the past year, that's what all the headlines have said. Take a look. Right here on the screen, New York Times Surgeon General, we have become a lonely nation. U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, new Surgeon General Advisory raises alarm about the devastating impact of the epidemic of loneliness. World Health Organization, Americans are lonely and it's killing them. According to research as recent as October 2023 from Meta Gallup, nearly one in four people worldwide report feeling fairly or very lonely. This social problem is so bad that the World Health Organization has declared loneliness to be a pressing global threat, with the U.S. Surgeon General saying that its mortality or effects are equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Additional studies have reported that 81% of people surveyed admit that making lasting friendships is hard. And 45% of Americans say it's difficult to make new friends. U.S. Today says you can be surrounded by lots of people and you can have lots of followers or connections on social media, but not feel like you've got anyone who knows you or shows up for you in a crisis. Today we're continuing our series, Find Your People. And for the past few weeks, Brian has talked about the why of Christian community, how the church is people, not a building, and how the best types of community are found when you're on mission together. Today, I'm excited to practically dig into how to find your people. Because maybe you're one of the 25% who have said that you feel lonely. Maybe it's the reason that you've even agreed to come to church in the first place. If you're here on campus, you can look down the row to your left and to your right. These people don't look so bad, right? If you're watching from home, it's a whole different story there. Maybe you've got great friends, but they're all long distance. Maybe your best friends are from a time of your past. Childhood, high school, college, the good old days, pre-job, pre-kid, pre-now. Come to think of it, you don't know the last time you've made a new friend who knows you right here. Or maybe, maybe you have tons of friends from all different eras of your life, and you're just trying to figure out how to get the right people on the right seat of the friendship bus. Anthropologist Robin Dunbar proposed a theory that humans can only maintain a limited number of social relationships. You can see the graphic right here. He says that number is 150. Anything over that number, you're not really going to know them. Acquaintances, maybe recognition, Facebook friends. Actually, the algorithms on social media have used the number 150 to create their algorithms for their networks. And anything under is where you get real community. Obviously, the smaller you go, the more you're known by that circle group. The same research is found in New York Times bestseller Jenny Allen's book, Find Your People. Yes, there's a book about this topic. Yes, I have read it, done a book club study on it, bought multiple copies of the book because A, I'm a nerd, and B, I believe it's that important. You see, as you notice here, Jenny uses the same graphic as Dunbar, but really focuses on the two most inner circles. Outside of God, the center, your inner circle of three to five friends, and your village of people as well. Because what Jenny's research shows and what lots of adults know by now is that it's not so much about how many friends you have. It's about finding, nurturing, and maintaining the quality of the community that you have around you. So how do we get 
that. Well, lucky for us, one of the most popular stories in the Bible is about community. And it teaches everything we need to know to practically fight this loneliness epidemic. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 2. If you've got your phone, it can come up on the Bible app, our CCV app, or you can follow along right here on the screen. Jesus heals a paralyzed man. Verse 2 says, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come. They gathered in such large numbers, there was no room left not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then lowered the mat the man was laying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. There is so much to learn from this story. But first, let's acknowledge the sheer responsibility that these friends have. One, to carry their friend, a paralyzed man, all the way to the place where Jesus is preaching. They get there, they realize they can't get in, so they've got to go up to the top of the roof, get to the roof, and then they figure out a way that they need to get in. I mean, this is like a much more serious version of the 90 sitcom Friends episode Pivot! (laughs) Pivot! 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 I mean, think about it. These friends had to be coordinated. They had to be on purpose. They had to be well willing to pivot over and over and over again or else the Bible story would be called Paralyzed Man Falls from the Ceiling. In actuality... Can you imagine what life was like for a paralytic in the ancient world? This man's whole life was lived on a mat that was six feet by two feet wide. Anytime he wanted food, he had to beg. He was at the mercy of people who were willing to be generous. He couldn't travel. He couldn't clean himself. He couldn't feed himself. There was no surgery to be done. There was no appointment he could go to. There was no hope, no family to help, no future, no possibilities for this man. Seemingly, this man had nothing. Except he did. This man had one thing. He had great friends. In fact, this man's friends are the entire reason that this Bible story even exists. So what can we learn from this first century story and how can we apply it when it comes to finding our people practically in the 21st century? Deep community doesn't happen on accident. Let's get practical. How do we develop deep community? Three things this story teaches us. One, we have to investigate. Two, initiate. And three, invest. Three eyes. See, I told you I'm a nerd. Step one investigate. Notice who's already right in front of you. I'm not quite sure what this looked like for the man on the paralyzed mat. Did he notice the men who were dropping coins to him most often and finally get the courage to speak up? Maybe he noticed the same guys passing by him over and over and over again. However it happened, This man's investigating, his noticing, worked. You see, because people rarely drift into community. 
Research tells us that in a world that's experiencing a loneliness epidemic, people will be best connected and find their best connections in social circles which they already exist. Work, school, neighborhoods, your kids, friends, parents, social activities, and here at church, serving groups and small groups. Yet, Jenny Allen writes in her book, most of us choose to hold on to friends from past lives, believing that since nobody who's right here in front of us will ever measure up to these precious people, why bother making new friends? I remember the day our best friends left, friends that we made here at this church. I probably told the story before. I remember when they told my husband and I that they were moving, which apparently is 63% of the reason that adult friendships can fail or drift, relocation. It was at a previous HSM student's wedding. We were all youth leaders together. We were celebrating the wedding. And during the reception, they took us out to the back of the venue, and they told us their news, that they were moving so that they could be near family as they raised their own. And we wept. Well, three of us cried. My husband doesn't cry because he says he's a tough guy, but... I thought that only happened in the movies. We did everything together. We served together. We were in small group together. We went on dates together. We raised our kids together. We were supposed to raise our kids together. I didn't think I needed other friends until I did. And it was this step, this first step of investigating and noticing the people around me that helps me find my people. Plural, not just one. Shame on me for putting the responsibility of community on one friendship with one couple. So my husband and I, we sought out other couples in our small group, started hanging out with them. I looked at women in my church groups and I said, who do I want to be in a Bible study with? And I am in a Bible study with those same women six years later who I talk to nearly every day. I went and figured out who my kids' friends were and befriended their parents and in the neighborhood. I was able to do that, and it's ongoing. Every year, my husband and I review our friendships in what we call our annual state of the floras. It's our, like, January goal session. We ask ourselves, who are we close with? Who do we want to get to know? And how can we be better, be better friends? Are we still amazing friends with that couple? Absolutely. We will always be lifelong friends. But as Jenny Allen shares, we all need a network of regular people who are present in our daily lives. People who, like in the last week and a half, who I've texted with every day that we've had a school closing this week, which has been almost every day, People like who I can ask to, hey, can you print out a paper and put that in your mailbox because it's 7.30 at night and I've got to print out a picture for my kid's school project. People who came to my house unprompted to clear a tree that blocked my driveway after the windstorm a week and a half ago. People who we went sledding with on Friday on a whim during the snowstorm. People who prayed and encouraged me in preparation of today's message. Not just our close people, our close up people. Obviously that was true for the paralyzed man. His community literally couldn't exist with people in the next town over. He physically couldn't get there. So he had to look at who was near him often. In Jenny Allen's Find Your People book, there's a friend map where you can do an exercise to figure out who's already in front of you. Basically, each of the places you go during a week are in the circle. So church or work or, or neighborhood or friend sports. And then in each rectangle, you list people you might want to invest in, that you want to investigate a friendship with. And if you're missing a block, 
Maybe that's your signal to join a serving group or a small group right here at CCV. I hear our community is looking for an Eagle support group. <laughs> the next part is where things get a little awkward. Step two, initiate. Find the courage to put yourself out there. Think about what the paralyzed man went through in order to become friends with these four men. Because of his physical condition, the deck was already stacked against friendships with him. At some point, he had to be okay with the fact that he wasn't able to offer these four friends the same thing he desired in friendship. At some point, he had to be okay and work up the courage to say, will you be my friends? Kids are so much better at this than adults, right? I often go to the playground with my youngest, she's five, and we'll be playing on the playground, and sometimes we'll be in a foreign country, so she'll be playing with kids that don't even speak her language, and she'll run back to me and say, Mom, I just met my best buddy. Really? What's her name? I don't know. <laughs> so often, we are afraid. Jenny Allen writes, we're all just kind of waiting for connection to find us. We're waiting for someone else to initiate, someone else to be there for us, someone else to make the plan or ask the perfectly crafted question to help us bear our souls. Many of us don't initiate a friendship because we are afraid of rejection. We're embarrassed that the person will say no. You know what's embarrassing? Waving at someone who wasn't waving at you. <laughs> Forgetting someone's name when it's socially unacceptable to ask them again, what's your name? It's embarrassing when somebody catches you looking at your reflection in the car mirror or a window. It's embarrassing to watch a Monday night football playoff game and have the score be 9 to 32. I, I really need that support group. What's not embarrassing is having the courage to act in spite of fear because you know it's worth it. One of my friends did this recently. She was going through the pain points of a divorce and within a crazy season of raising her two teen boys, working two jobs, finalizing the divorce, putting her house on the market, finding a new place to live, she reached out to 10 friends and texted. Hi, ladies. Okay, so difficult for me to ask, but I need your help. I need my village. Please let me know if you can help in any way. And then she proceeded to list a, a whole bunch of questions and needs. Silence in the group chat. Moments, minutes went by. And then finally, boom, 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 boom. Text after text, people came flooding in to help. People over her house bringing her meals, bringing her boxes, helping her declutter her house, helping her sell her things on Facebook, crying with her in the middle of her kitchen when it was hard, celebrating with her when she sold her house, when she got her new house. She labeled that group chat, my village. I love that. As someone who was in that chat, it gives so much power to know that you are in someone's village. What would have happened if my friend didn't initiate? Obviously, it would have taken her longer to pack her house. She would have felt lost and alone. The emotionality of the whole process could have gotten the best of her. She would have had no one to celebrate with. If you're thinking, I've done that for so long, I've sent the text, I've asked the question, I've tried and tried and no one's reciprocating. Jenny Allen writes, be sad for a minute and then get over it. 
Because no matter how many times you've tried and failed, no matter what your age is, no matter the awkwardness, because it will be awkward, it's never too late to start until it is. Imagine how the paralyzed man felt. How many times must he have asked for food? How many times must he have asked for money? How many times must he have asked for a friend before someone said yes? We go first. We initiate. Because once you figure out who you want your people to be, they'll never know you want them to be your people until you initiate. So make the group chat. Step three, invest in your people. Research shows that it takes 50 hours to build a casual friendship, 90 hours to form friends that are real, and 200 hours to get real close to friends. If you want to figure out how to move people from an acquaintance to in your village, from in your village to your close up inner core friends, it's investment, intentional investment. John Ortberg, he's an author, wrote a commentary on the scripture, The Paralyzed Man. And he said this, wise people do not try to microwave friendship or parenting or marriage. You can't do community in a hurry. You can't listen in a hurry. You can't mourn or rejoice in a hurry. You can't carry someone's mat in a hurry. And everyone comes with a mat. Think about it. This man's closest friends were four strong, physically capable and able men. They were physically able to do something that he was not able to do. Now, Scripture doesn't say how this man felt to be carried by his friends, but it's probably obvious that allowing it to happen was vulnerable. Was he insecure? Did he feel embarrassed? Did he feel awkward? Was he jealous of these friends? Was he thankful for these friends? Whatever he felt, it was because he allowed himself to be vulnerable that all of these friends, all of these mat carriers were able to be more honest about their own mats. It's what John Ortberg calls the fellowship of the mat. You see, because here's the truth. Everybody has a mat. It's like that Oprah joke. You have a mat, and you have a mat, and everybody has a mat. We don't ever want people to see what's on our mat. But the only way that we can have fellowship of the mat is with a mat. If you want deep friendship, you can't always be the strong one. You can't always be the guy on the roof. You will sometimes have to let other people carry your mat. When I was sharing this message with my husband, he commented, men are terrible at this. Now, I know I'm generalizing here, but often for men, vulnerability of any sort or maybe admitting a weakness is hard. It's hard for women. It's harder for men. You might answer the question, yeah, I have close friends. And then when your wife asks you, what real questions did you talk about? You say, I don't know. From observation, you men think you have to have it all together. Like this guy. The one man wolf pack. Do not be like Alan, the one man wolf pack. Maybe your first step, men and women, because let's admit, I'll be the first to say, I don't like sharing my mat. 
Maybe the first step is acknowledging that we have to share our mat if we want deep community. It's not possible any other way. This is finding your people. When each of you throughout life takes turns carrying each other through your moments on the mats, investment means asking the deep, hard questions. Asking questions that are intentional and uncomfortable about finances and marriage and relationships and spirituality and self-love. Investment in your people means being there when it's not easy. Showing up and bringing your kids along so they can see what real community looks like. It means showing your emotions. It means initiating the prayer. It means that you are willing to grab a corner of the mat unasked and move forward. That's community as God intended it to be. Here's my last point, and perhaps it's obvious. But it should not be unsaid that at the core of this friendship, the paralyzed man and his friends, was God. It's the same model that Jenny Allen uses in her diagram from her book. Go to that circle one, yeah. God is at the center, and then your inner circle and your village. Not one best friend. God is at the center. And that sets up for a healthy friendship. It says, Jesus said, what are the two most important commandments? Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. When these four friends were carry carrying the paralyzed man to Jesus, when they faced adversity and had to find a different way through the house, when they had to pivot and say, we'll just ma dismantle the whole house to get our friend in, it was all for the sake of getting their friend to Jesus. Ortberg shares this. In this moment, Jesus sees a little of what God intended when he made human beings. He sees people who love even in the, in the face of shame and brokenness. He thinks to himself, this is humanity at its finest. This is what separates our close up Christian friendships from every other amazing, incredible, lifelong, close friendship. Humanity at its finest, mission-minded, bringing one another closest to Jesus. Imagine what a modern day man or woman on the mat story here at CCV would look like. Imagine if one of us in this room was brave enough to say to three or four friends, man, I'm struggling with finances and I need help. Or maybe if someone else said, I've been in therapy for a year because I'm depressed and I've told no one. Imagine what our people would look like if we were brave enough to say, I need help. I want to love myself better. I want to work less. I want to care more. I want to do more. And imagine the pride you would feel if you were one of the three to four to, without question, grab a corner of the mat and move forward towards Jesus. You'd be better. Your friends would be better. This church would be better. So yes, are we in a loneliness epidemic? Yes. But here, in this community, we have the hope of the church. As followers of Jesus, we have the fellowship of the mat. And when we are on mission together, Deep community is possible. But it won't happen on accident. So let's investigate. Let's initiate. And let's invest. Let's find our people.
Let's pray. God, we are so thankful that you have given us the local church as a place for one another to find each other. God, we pray this week that you give us the courage to initiate, to investigate, and to invest, to share our mats so that we are able to develop deep community. We thank you so much for being at the center of that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.